All right, great. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anshul Rege, and uh, I'm excited to be here. It's the first time I'm attending and also presenting at SHMU. Um, and one of the things I want to share with you today um, is some of the struggles that I have as an educator uh, dealing with undergraduate populations in the social sciences. Um, and one of the complaints I often get from my students is, well, we can't do anything hands-on in the area of cybersecurity like our technical counterparts. So um, what I want to share with you is an attempt to try to do something a little bit different in education, uh, try to do something that's a little bit more hands-on. Uh, but also ask a larger question is whether we should be exposing students across multiple disciplines to the social science side of uh, cyber attacks and cyber security. So before I dive in, a couple of folks that I have to thank, the Idaho National Labs, Center for Advanced Energy Studies, Idaho Regional Optical Network, and of course, the National Science Foundation. So a little bit of background, um, I am a junior professor with the Department of Criminal Justice at Temple University, so this is under the College of Liberal Arts, and I look at um, the human side of cyber attacks and cybersecurity in my research. And, you know, one of the questions that I often get asked is, why is social science relevant? And I think we can all agree here uh, that cyber is obviously more than just the technical, right? It involves human behavior. It involves decision making. It involves interaction. It involves working in groups. And these are all very complex, dynamic, social phenomena, and that's what the social sciences is, is there for. It's there to understand this, to unpack um, the underlying processes and these nuances that make up human behavior. We also have, as a discipline, many theoretical frameworks that we can bring to the table that can help understand cyber attacks and cybersecurity from a different perspective, which might shed light on certain things. Um, and of course, we also have different methodological approaches. We observe, we interview, we do field research. So what can that bring to the table as well? So I've been teaching for about five and a half years, and one of the classes that I teach is an upper-level elective for undergraduate students, a cybercrime class. And for the first two years, you know, I'm a new professor, um, and I say, all right, well, I'm going to go look at what other professors are doing. How do they teach a cybercrime or a computer crime class? And almost unanimously, all the syllabi that I looked at were, hey, go pick a research topic, write a paper, and at the end of the semester, do a presentation. And that's what I did. And uh, at the end of the second year, I had a student come up to me and say, wow, you know, this is really great. I had fun. I wish I could pursue cybersecurity as a, you know, as a career option. And I said, well, why not? Why can't you? And so, well, I don't know how to hack. I don't know how to code. I don't know how to do any of those technical things. And it's, you know, it's, it's okay not to know that. It's okay to know a little bit about that. It's okay to know about that. But you don't have to know enough technical details to look at cybersecurity from a different perspective, which is the human side. And that's what my research uh, is all about. So as an educator, this to me is a little upsetting. Uh, because I do feel that we need to train the next generation of social scientists to feel that they can confidently, you know, uh, feel confident moving forward and have a say in the cybersecurity dialogue. And so then I turn to my technical colleagues, and I'm so envious, right, because um, even at Temple in the computer science department, they have classes on ethical hacking or pen testing, or students can go out and compete and capture the flags. What can we do for the social science student um, that is something that's hands-on, that moves beyond, hey, write a research paper? So 
the question then becomes is, um, can the social sciences be structured a little bit like its technical counterparts, right? Like, can we do something hands-on? Um, how can we do that? What might that look like? Um, can we train the next generation of social scientists uh, in the area of cyber attacks and cybersecurity, uh, in the area of quote-unquote cyber field research? What does that look like without you know, telling them, hey, go convert and move to a different discipline? Because what's the point then of the social sciences, right? And more importantly, taking it a step further, can we and should we expose students across the technical domains like the computer science fields, like the electrical and computer engineering fields, to the human side of things? And why might that be relevant or important? So I thought, all right, wouldn't it be cool if I could design a course project that was based on this experiential learning model? There's lots of other you know, ways that an experiential learning model might be framed, uh, but this is a very popular one. And it's obviously, it's got five stages, the first one obviously being doing something. So you actually perform the activity, whatever that might be, and then you share and you reflect on it, right? So what did I get out of it? What are some of the challenges I faced? How did I overcome these? Generalize, you connect it to real world examples and then you apply what you've learned either to a similar setting or something different in the future. And so I said, all right, I have my task cut out for me. How am I going to design a course project that utilizes this model at the foundational level? And Part of our NSF project, our National Science Foundation research project, was in partnership with the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we did a joint course project where we brought together criminal justice students and electrical and computer engineering students to do something innovative at an undergraduate level? And so that's what I want to share with you, is this course project that was done in the spring 2016 semester. And I'm not going to have enough time to go through all of the details, but if you're interested, this uh, study was actually published just last year in an IEEE conference proceedings. I have some copies here that I've brought with me if you want to take a look at it. Um, but what I will offer is a little bit of highlights from that. So the way this project was constructed is Idaho National Labs has created a uh, simulation of a power grid. It's a software that engineering students can download and run, and um, they're essentially in charge of their own microgrid, right? So they have to understand all the engineering concepts, but then there's an additional layer of cybersecurity. So your grid could be subjected to a cyber attack. And then how are you going to put on your defender hat in addition to being a power grid operator and hopefully keep your grid up and not have a blackout? So that's the objective for the engineering student. What my students did um, is they had to observe defender behavior to understand what types of decision making is happening um, at that level. And so my class, I had about 18 students that semester mostly from the liberal arts, but I did have one computer science student and one engineering student. And we structured the exercise in two parts. In the first one, nobody was familiar with anything, right? So the engineering students were trying out the grid game. Uh, my students were observing the engineering students. And this was just to establish a baseline for everyone. And um, also uh, gave my students a chance to develop their qualitative skill sets. In the second part of the project, which was the same exercise that we did a month later, we decided to change things up a little bit. Um, and so Idaho National Labs gave my students a complete list of all the attacks that could be launched against the simulated grid, what part of the grid it would go after, and the type of damage it would cause. Okay, so my students were given all of this information, and then I told my students, all right, you guys are going to have to design the best attack sequence. So pick a malicious objective, you're going to have a timed attack sequence, and then you're going to tell me why you think that attack sequence is the best one, and then you're going to predict well, how the engineering students are going to behave, right? Moving beyond, hey, go write a research paper, right? Actually doing something hands-on from a social science perspective. So this is what it 
looked like. Okay, so this is what uh, the exercise uh, room was looked like. Okay, so we didn't have a lot of space. We all uh, came together in one room. And the engineering students huddled around the computer that they were running the, uh, the simulated software on, their power grids. And then my students were situated around them to do observations and interviews. And again, I'm not going to get into all of the findings, but if you're interested, uh, I did bring copies of the paper here. So if we go into that stage one, right, like the doing part, um, and with regards to CFR, the cyber field research, students were finally able to design a data collection instrument from scratch. This is what social scientists have to do. We have to develop our data collection instruments. So they had to, and this is student driven, right? So I'm not telling them what kind of questions you should be asking. They have to read up on the literature. They are behind the driver's wheel. I'm just there to sort of navigate. Um, what questions would you ask before the exercise, during the exercise, after the exercise? What types of things are you looking at for, uh, you know, in terms of observations? Are you looking at how are they making decisions about whether or not to buy uh, antivirus software, for instance? Um, is there cohesion? Is there conflict? What does that look like? Right? And so you had to design these, and then you actually had to take them out on the field, the field being the actual exercise as it unfolded. And then you have to see if, whether or not your data collection instrument is any good. And what the students have found very quickly, and this is very much the case for social scientists when they go out into you know, field work, is you had to adapt. You had to think on the fly, right? So um, you had your interview guide. You had your observation guide. But things are very dynamic. They're shifting. Um, so based on what you observed, you might think of a new question to ask because you don't want to miss that moment. You want to capture that essence. With regards to cyber attack and cybersecurity, the CACS portion of this, as I said, uh, students were given information about the attack details, right? So they had to come up with an attack sequence. They had to come up with a timetable. They had to come up with a justification for this and what they thought um, you know, might be the response from the engineering student. And of course, uh, my students thought this was awesome. They had a lot of fun with this because they said playing the attackers was fun, right? Because we knew what was coming, but the engineering students did not. With regards to sharing from a research perspective, right, one of the things that my students were extremely nervous about was speaking with engineers. Are they going to understand what we're asking? Are we going to understand what they say? And when you get, this is at the undergraduate level, right? When I'm doing research with engineers and computer scientists, this is precisely the problem that I have, is we don't understand each other a lot of times. So why isn't this conversation happening at an undergraduate level, right? So they figured out their own way to make things work, right? These were all students, so they preferred a more informal style of conversation, which made the entire process a lot smoother. The data collection process went well. With regards to attacks and security, and in the sharing sort of stage, um, as I mentioned, my students got the complete set of attacks. So what I did was I told the students, divide yourselves up into groups, Go design your attack schedules, bring them to class, write them on the whiteboard, and we're going to battle it out. Each team has to convince the rest of the class why your schedule is the best one, right? And so this forced students to really start thinking about the pros and the cons of the different attack vectors, okay? The relevance of sequence, right? How are you going to time the different attacks? The duration, how long are you going to pause before you launch the next attack? And why are you doing this? And so they battled it out, and then two of the best attack sequences were chosen. So, right, I wish I could dig a little bit more deeper and tell you more about this, but uh, what I want to switch to real quickly are what are some of the challenges of trying to do something like this, and then what are the pros of that as well? Multidisciplinary communication. Right? You need to talk. And so uh, one of the ways that they, uh, the students figured it out was let's make things informal. But they also read ahead of time 
to understand the environment. So they actually read the grid game manual, okay, so that they were familiar with uh, the layout of the software. They familiarized themselves with the interface so that they knew when the engineering students were pointing and clicking on different tabs what they were trying to do, right? So you have to train yourself a little bit that way. Uh, communication once the attacks were actually launched. So as with any sort of red, blue type exercise, once you know, you're in the heat of the activity, you're gonna get frustrated. And then at that point, you don't really wanna talk. So the, so the, you know, my students figured out, all right, this is a time not to ask questions, but really amp up on the observations. So how are you going to toggle between these methods to make the most out of the situation so you can still get good data? Logistically, there were a lot of problems. Uh, spatial logistics, like I said, we were all in one room, so the different engineering students could overhear you know, the other team's strategies, which influenced their own play. Uh, methodological hurdles, we had a lot of those too. Right, there was a lot of background noise because everyone was um, in the room together. Despite all of that, I think there were still some um, benefits. And uh, we moved beyond the traditional classroom assignment. We got to do something hands-on, right? It's a step, small step in that direction. Um, by no way means, you know, is this representative of a real cyber attack uh, or real-time attack defense even, right? But it, again, the, the, the idea here is to arm the students to be able to develop methodological skills, um, to be able to understand attack complexity, to understand what impacts this might have on infrastructure, just to open their eyes to this, to understand reactive versus proactive defense and to hopefully give them a little bit more confidence, right? So you don't have a non you don't have a technical background and it's okay. You can still think at an abstract level. You can think using that mindset, the adversarial mindset. So um, there's still a long ways to go. This was just one case study. We tried this again with a graduate class and another undergraduate class. Um, and this semester we're trying, we, we are trying something different, which is a different sort of social science course project. We're doing social engineering um, and we're getting the students to compete against each other. We also have our um, computer services department involved in the project. So there's a lot of avenues to go through with this and um, this is all very new to me as an educator. So um, that's everything that I have for you. If you have any comments or questions or feedback, I'd really appreciate it. Thanks. So for this, this is all on the education side. For the research side, yeah, we're working with Florida International, Virginia Tech. Yeah, so, um, and uh, recently with Carnegie Mellon, yeah. Yes, sorry. Right, so part of the reason why we stuck with the electrical engineering department is because we had a joint grant and NSF also requires us to do something from an education side. But I have, and this was literally, we've only done this for a year. Um, so I have reached out to the business school and uh, the business school at Temple is really big as well. They have an auditing and all those kinds of things, but it, it will take some time to get something in action. Yes, Thank, thanks. Yes. Well, the best one I can think of is Gabrielle Coleman. And if you, uh, I mean, she's written a fantastic book on this. So, you know, from, from that sort of perspective. So, um, yeah. Yes, sir.
We are, and um, it's like I said, it's not in you know a snap that we're going to get it to work. It takes a lot of, just to get this one. It took us about six months to eight months to to develop something. And even if we didn't have Idaho National Labs on board, we wouldn't have a platform to even try something like this out. Um, I'm also working with um, human factors engineers and cognitive psychologists, but those are with the military labs right now outside of an education environment. But it would be cool to bring that in uh, into the education front. Yeah. Yes. Quite. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, well, the grant is over. Uh, this particular course project, we might do that. We might not even involve engineering students. We might just get um, the social science students to do both sides of things to see if that can be, you know, still incorporated. But yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, good. Thank you very much.